Are we doomed to climate change? Sometimes it feels that way. Iqbal Badruddin is an activist turned climate scientist based in Pakistan. I think for someone who feels like it's doomed and actually losing interest in climate change, education and stuff, uh, the best way for, or I personally think, is to show them the people who are actually suffering from climate change. Pakistan is one of the world's most vulnerable countries to the consequences of climate change. 2022 was one of the worst on record. I have just returned from Pakistan, where I looked through a window into the future. A future of permanent and ubiquitous climate chaos on an unimaginable scale. One third of the nation was submerged by flooding, with 1,700 Pakistanis killed in floods in 2022, and 33 million Pakistanis displaced and still scrambling to survive. Padruddin knows of one man who lost everything to the floods and was so desperate that he asked emergency rescuers to end his suffering. He requested them actually uh, to actually ask the chief minister or the prime minister or the army chief to actually bomb their village. He was like, I cannot see my family die like this. And we are done. We are starving. We are hungry. Uh, and he, 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 he asked her for a favor. He's like, I'm serious. I'm not joking. I know you can't do anything. Please just do a favor. Ask them to just bomb our village so that we can just die at once. Is there a solution? The reason national action plans are really critical is because it helps countries address the specific challenges that they face in their country. No matter what we do as individuals, it ultimately comes down to entities larger than us, like corporations and countries, to take action. And they have, in small strides. The Kyoto Protocol was adopted on December 11, 1997, and at the time was considered to be the most significant step towards collectively slowing global warming. So how did the Kyoto Protocol shape collective climate action? The Kyoto Protocol was the first legally binding climate treaty. It separated countries into two groups, developed and developing. The protocol placed emission limitations on developed countries only, while developing nations volunteered to invest in projects designed to lower emissions. For these projects, developing countries earned carbon credits, which could be sold or traded to developed countries, allowing them a higher level of maximum carbon emissions for that period. One credit equals one ton of carbon emissions. Proponents say the system is double incentivized. If a company exceeds its carbon cap, they must spend money to buy extra carbon credits. If it uses less than the cap, the company stands to make money by selling the excess credits. Critics, however, say the function failed to stop developed countries from vigorously emitting harmful greenhouse gases. In fact, greenhouse gas emissions jumped 40% globally between 1990 and 2009. The Kyoto Protocol only went so far because two huge carbon emitters, China and India, failed to ratify the agreement. And the U.S. backed out of it in 2001 under then-President George W. Bush, citing the burden it placed on the American economy. We'll be working with our allies to reduce greenhouse gases, but I will not accept a plan that will harm our economy and hurt American workers. In 2015, a more comprehensive treaty emerged called the Paris Agreement. It was the most significant global climate agreement to date since it required its 194 signatories to set emissions reduction pledges. The goal is to prevent the global average temperature from rising 2.1 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and pursues efforts to keep it below 1.5 degrees Celsius. What's the significance of the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold? The scientific community has reached a consensus on some facts. The Earth's average temperature is rising at an unprecedented rate. 
human activities, namely the use of fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas, are the primary drivers of this rapid warming and climate change. And continued warming is expected to have harmful effects worldwide. As of 2021, average temperatures had already risen above 1.1 degrees Celsius and is predicted to surpass the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold in the next few decades, even if drastic measures are taken. That's according to a 2021 assessment by the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. What that means is more heat waves, droughts and floods, rising sea levels, Arctic ice thaws, and the loss of species. Scientists say the consequences will be far greater if the two degrees Celsius threshold is reached. The US, EU, and China have since updated their commitments to cut emissions by 2030. But even so, climate trackers expect average temperatures to rise 2.1 degrees Celsius by 2100. It will take a collective effort to mitigate disasters. And although that burden falls on all of us in some capacity, it's up to nations and corporations to really make it happen. Thank you.